Hello everyone, we're about to show you a session we ran at the recent ISC 2022 show in Barcelona. What's the point of virtual studios? VR studios are a great example of Pro AV technology being combined with broadcast technology. The studio technology, content servers and LED displays are all Pro AV applications, but the broadcast technology is used for the capture switching IP encoding and distribution. This approach has proved to be particularly successful during the periods of social distancing, where corporate events were replaced with high quality streamed events. In short, this is all about creating next generation visual experiences, which is what AV should be all about, and it's how we can attract new talent into our industry. Our ISC session took place on Absence Stand with Brian McCorto, Absence Director of Virtual Production, Joanna Alp, Chief Commercial Officer at Build Studios, Sarah Cox from Neutral Human, Vince Deanhook, Founder and Managing Director of Evoke Studios, and David Gray, Managing Director of Lux Machina Consulting, or part of NEP Virtual Studios. Here's how the session went. So, uh, I know we're going to hear this over and over again, but uh, when The Mandalorian came out, of course, everybody was talking about the technology used in that amazing production. First of all, everybody loves the content that was created. It was an amazing piece. And then to realize how the creative process happened there was game-changing in this industry. Uh, so because of that, it created this a huge amount of buzz for virtual production. And of course, everybody wants to take advantage of this new tech. So I would say the change in the industry happened when this amazing creative content of The Mandalorian was made that was the catalyst for everything to start moving into virtual production for many reasons. The creative flexibility, the uh, lowering of the environmental impact, um, timelines, budgets, everything. Uh, virtual production has a lot of advantages, and I think Mando was the reason for that. But, you know, there are two different worlds now, Brian, aren't they? I'm sorry to keep on this, really, but, you know, we're trying to make more of a link between the AV industry and the film and the other. We've just done a major AV film and broadcast stuff that has been incredibly popular in terms of reactions from the AV industry, interestingly enough. And it's how this sort of transition happened when people realised in film that perhaps they could replay screen to another and you know, additional world and physical could come, somehow come together. I mean, who, I suppose you've seen that one in, in Lord of the Rings, haven't we? We've done some of it. But there's still a bit of a leap between them test and experimental phase where they thought, well, actually, we'll commit to this and us as a player thought, this may be an emerging market for us. But when did that sort of magical link moment come when uh, the two holes started to go together and actually did some really hard press work? And I'm not, I'm going to give you a hard time because you're more experienced, you're coming from, you're probably the most experienced person I know. such as Stipe follower tracking systems um, 
all these technologies developing together enabled this new type of content creation to be possible. Uh, Ten years ago, pixel pitches weren't there to actually look really amazing on a camera. And also, the color reproduction of LED wasn't there either. So, it's the combination of the technologies that are being developed consistently throughout uh, the history of LED that enabled this to happen. Jesus, the next question. Thank you very much, Brian. I didn't want to give you hard time. I love you really. Um, is perhaps a, a quick one with um, uh, uh, gone brain dead. Here we are, Joanna. Bill Studios. We know Bill Studios very well, don't we? But um, it's a question of making those links. And, I mean, we, we, we've seen virtual studios being built by production areas for the mastering. I mean, Part of Where do we go? What, what, what point do we start before we get to that point of, well, actually, this particular approach to be create, creating a production that actually uses the elements we have here? And I wouldn't go too much into them because it might just make a complicated picture. I'm trying to keep it clear. Where do they go? Where does the expertise and skill come from to make that first step? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, yeah, just to follow on from what Brian was saying, I think there just was such an incredible moment through the pandemic where you just have convergence, right? And so, at, at its essence, virtual production is this convergence of the film industry, of this hardware, AV technology, um, and gaming. And so you have these three industries that have been really doing their own thing quite happily that all of a sudden have to play nice together, have to work together um, and that's a huge challenge um, and I guess in, in my career I've been involved in bringing innovation to new markets and commercialising that and really that's just what we're doing, right? So we've had this innovative moment and then we've had an amazing showcase in the Mandalorian and now all of us are trying to figure out how that commercialises and so how that makes sense to the widest range of productions and projects. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering what you asked. <laughs> trying to take little steps to build up a picture that's clear for people because otherwise we're making too big a leap. At the moment, you know, I'm seeing lots of virtual, well, not, not lots, but obviously very impressive virtual production environments to which you can go from a bit of this work consultancy and everything else, which I think is probably a good place to start. But the other part of my brain thinks what applications are going to be um, immediately obvious in this, you know, and where do we go and how do we commun communicate, as you said, with very different communities with different cultures, how do you get this, this clear idea, not just technically, but creatively over these so, well, this is a potential opportunity. Yes. I see it as a fantastic opportunity for, for, for tackling new people and new talent coming into the industry as being aware, just yeah. completely changing, changing the yeah. game yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, I think we'll go to you actually, if I may. Virtual production is um, quite umbrella, and I think as an industry, the next step into AV is how we, we clarify that virtual production in film is one thing. But virtual production, which is track cameras, um, that ability to take a track camera and use a game engine technology and bring those artists and um, creative tools, we can translate that through AV equipment um, into many, many industries. And we're actually doing that in XR. So we're doing that in broadcast with these volumes, the same technology, but we're doing it with a slightly different reason. We're going to be doing it in live event. We're going to be using it in concert touring to add AR experiences. So the, the term of virtual production, I think, we're focused on film because it's where it's the most visible from a Mandalorian perspective. But corporate application, people are waking up in advertising. It, the, that convergence with AV is coming fast. Um, and we need the next, you know, the next people who are gonna be doing this is that skill set. People that have a skill set of editing or, or working in me anything with media, um, it's a timeline. It, we can translate those skills into virtual production and, and use those across multiple industries. Uh, Sarah Cox, by the way, had a complete brain there. <laughs> it happens occasionally. Um, I'll, I'll come to Vince Steenhart next and just, just tell us what you've been up to and sort of develop the theme a bit. 
uh, and to see how we can just get into your mindset and see what you've been doing so far and how you're developing your business. I mean, all these businesses can go so many different routes, couldn't they? And it's quite nice to see that because it's a completely open field. It depends how the market responds with whatever... Um, it's, clear, it's nice to see whatever clear requirements you're seeing appear that might give us some clue about which of the first industries to take advantage. You can see it instantly but in, in live, live, live geese car. I mean, it's a complete no-brainer, I would think. And it's where they're all going now with dramatic experiences to stand out for everybody else. But I think they're leaving everybody in the minute, aren't they, really? So it's extraordinary stuff going on that's well ahead of everything else. So tell us where we are so far. What's been creating market demand over the last couple of years? Of course, people have needed uh, you know, remote access to each other. They've needed remote access to information. Uh, people have been, you know, everyone wants to keep producing and, and sharing information. And these, these new techniques, these new ways of working, they, they have very much enabled that. I think in many ways, uh, you know, what's happened in the world in the last couple of years has, has strongly accelerated the development of, of all these workflows, of all these technologies, that all these, you know, amazing companies uh, are, are pulling together. And, uh, you know, and it's companies like ours that are, you know, in a favorable position to, to, to leverage that, to, to create new experiences, to create amazing content for, for cinema screens and, and for broadcast. And for us, it means that you know, we, we also make distinctions between these different solutions, between you know, broadcast scale, augmented reality, extended reality, and, and in-camera VFX. And to us, they're really distinctly different things, and they solve different problems, and they belong with different clients and, and, and customers. And uh, it's, it's been really fun for us, actually, to play within these, these different contexts, because we get to working in corporate markets where you know we might still design a physical set, but then we extend it with augmented reality set elements, and you know we can we can make their conference calls visible on stage, and there is interaction that, that couldn't exist before in, in real time, and that's that's quite exciting. And we can, I think it's 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 really incredible if you look at extended reality, uh, and 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 corporate and the corporate market specifically. It's it's such a it's a very strong solution to to uh, for for product presentations uh, for people to share uh, you know either within their own companies or wider audiences and and it's you can do that at a quality where what people see on screen they can actually they can safely buy into it because it's accurate and uh, and I think that's that's been very enabling uh, likewise what Sarah is saying. It's super exciting to see, uh, you know, what dimension uh, these technologies are going to add in live events and concert touring, and when that's going to go live a little bit more. You can see that that's recently been happening at Coachella uh, with the guys of uh, All of It Now. They're doing some really, really interesting stuff, and um, and for us in broadcast, it's the same thing. Like, it, it's needed everywhere. It's it's such a clear value add for any you know any production when the content is done well. It really raises the bar, and uh, and. The, the best thing about it is that it's it's a very cross-contextual technology and, and a way of working. You know, and the convergence that Joanna mentions is definitely the case. There's also a lot of complexity in that because it means that every department suddenly needs to understand what is virtual production. Well, what can we ask of this? What are the requirements? How much time does this need? And there's a lot of people that think, oh yeah, but it runs in real time, so it must be faster, right? <laughs> Turns out it isn't really. It just moves parts of the process elsewhere, and you get flexibility in different areas. So you know, it's new problems that need solving, and a lot of learning that needs to happen across the board. And I think a lot of our companies are focused on the sustainability side of things at the moment to make sure that it can run in broadcast and you know surrounding areas. So. I mean, the difficulty I have with all this is, is there is so many. It's not a negative, but you know, we're thinking certainly. Uh, covering it from it we, so often we in the AV industry we come to technology first and forget the culture and we just this afternoon we've got a panel looking at standards and it's mainly been it's a new one that's appearing stage net in fact which is very much for live event companies and creating a new environment where compatible equipment you, we get the most out of it and here you're different with not just different technologies but different cultures from different completely radically different markets and 
and, and um, it's the other word I'm looking for, I can't remember the brain um, So you've got the technical difficulties of, of everything else. And then in the business side, we've got lots of digitization programs going on. So people are now thinking, well, actually, these, these individual elements that we thought we had and did one-off presentations within, perhaps we should make, be making them ready for other elements, so that, you know, boardroom and uh, presentation spaces that allow us to perhaps import some slightly more interesting combination of technologies to produce different facts, create different experiences on whatever scale we want. Now, that's way down the line. But the conversation we had yesterday, interesting from a major integrator, was already halfway down that road. It's actually AVISPL, so they have very traditional IT AV support thing, already now buying an experienced company, XTG. Now, you never thought that a few years ago. I'm thinking very much not workspace, but collaboration as a service, and how they redefine workspace as different elements of collaboration. For the first time, a bit of meat on the bone, which then leads into a very different way of thinking about how they use different combinations of technology in a variety of environments. Now, you can see in events there's going to be a quick win, absolutely amazing, complete redefinition of an experience. A little bit more different to get that over to a corporate environment that's used to very traditional ways of creating experiences for itself. There are budget issues, especially in the museum and, and thingy world, we're all Albert Hall, death with straits at the minute. They've all had their, they've all had been supported during COVID, but they are putting on amazing stuff for their own bad. But it's a huge leap for them to think, well, because we're seeing this around in the live event world, and they, they tend to watch what you're doing pretty closely, try and replicate that if they can in the real life world. Um, it's planning ahead, thinking infrastructure, not technology, to accommodate that, and that's changing all the time. You're dealing with so many different types of individual. It makes you wonder really how and where, and of course, and that, you know, you get a nice, a close set of competing, potentially competing products will work nice in a very small collection of suppliers and providers. But how do you extrapolate that and make it look like a Dante, for example, and put 450 people and expand those markets? So it's all this relatively conflicting areas of thought that we're sort of, and I'm wondering how, which bit to tackle first, really. What about you, David? What's your general view on it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Half an hour later. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> um, standardization oh, is, massive and I think because a lot of this technology is still you know beyond cutting edge and it's still bleeding edge you know we're still working out things on set every single day so to create a standard is a way off we're all trying to work towards it but it's impossible to do you know we're already talking about of synchronizing cameras and LED walls for a system you know genlock and sync systems we're now looking to other systems to do that so to standardize on that and then have a change it's tricky. Um, and not just standardization of technology, but also standardization of terminology even. Like you said, what is virtual production? Traditionally, virtual production was actually something like using a, vir a virtual environment like uh, the Polar Express or something like that. And now we've kind of said, okay, in-camera VFX is now virtual production. Yeah. But actually, in-camera VFX is a small part yeah. of that pie. And like Sarah said, there's then XR, there's AR, there's all these level layers on top. So standardizing that's tricky and also we've inserted ourselves into an industry which has done things their way for 100 years and is trying to explain to a DOP, a gaffer, an AC, why are we sticking this thing on your camera? <laughs> um, and film is quite protectionist where it would not be okay for one department to walk over to a camera and stick something on it usually. <laughs> so it's working out the politics as well in, in these things and I think actually Broadcasting and live events are definitely more, not innovative, but they're more ready to run <laughs> with cool new ideas. And yeah, standardization is huge. And standardization of education is something we've been talking about a lot. It's like, how can you certify someone to a level where they're good at being camera VFX or an XR code or whatever it may be? And that's something I think is an industry we need to get together and say, okay, tier one stages is this level of certification. A tier two, tier two stage is this level of certification and you know work together to do that because we are combining all these different industries like games live events film 
and they all have very different ways of working. The games industry is very methodical and they have massive aversion in and all this kind of thing, which is, you know, we might have named a file V1, V2, V3, V4, V4. <laughs> we weren't using a server to manage uh, iteration. Um, so as much as I'd love standardization, we're going to need to work really hard in the next few months and years to make it happen. I was going to go back to you, actually, Brian. Um, how is this going to change your tag? Screen development. How, how, is, uh, how is all this going to be? Is it going to affect how Alison develops its technologies and screens, for example? Well, absolutely. Um, the virtual production experience is all about creating an environment for creative people to have a new type of canvas to work on. But that tool has to absolutely fit their requirements. So we have to listen to their needs, um, what their technical requirements are as far as color gamuts that we have to hit, brightness levels that we have to hit, the way that the LED interacts with the camera lensing for more issues, for example, to give them more and more flexibility to have a medium to create on without limiting um, what they're able to do. So it's all about listening to the industry, um, identifying the current challenges that they're facing, and then researching and developing technology to address those specific concerns for this industry, which is very different from every other market that LED is currently uh, working in, meaning that the majority of our markets are worried about how LED looks to your eye, but this market worries about how LED looks to a camera system. So it's innately quite a bit different. My uh, line of thinking then is, again, it's, it's, it's so easy to go down the road without realizing how far you're going. Uh, is it going to lead to smaller package solutions and downloadable assets? That's what I'm thinking. You're seeing the big boys on the big screen doing it, but how long do you reckon it'll be before we start to have nicely packaged solutions? Well, the difficulty here is choice of screen, choice of software, is a particular engine appropriate? Are the skills going to be there for people working, managing, and developing it? And uh, how much is it going to cost me? So at the moment, when you're dealing with bespoke farming and natural production studio, and you've got the experts on tap, according to uh, producing um, your particular solution for a particular purpose, I wonder how long it is before we start to, and that will go on the, the moment, as the market grows and matures and starts to realize what it can and would like to do. Are you going to be involved in, say, producing something like a package solution down the line that will actually address certain markets and people just bolt in into an infrastructure and start to do, like, for example, a museum or other fixed installation areas that perhaps would just like a solution? We're going to service as solution routes, aren't we? What a good looking question. No um, Charles. <laughs> I think a turnkey solution or a package solution might be possible maybe in the XR world where we can create a standard solution with a standard size that can be implemented by a type of customer such as creative or a, a corporate customer or a university. I think in the film world, that might not be possible, and the reason is because every different project trying to create different scenes has different requirements completely. And having a turnkey volume is gonna to be too limiting to give that uh, director of photography and project the flexibility that they need. Some projects might need an enormous ceiling and an enormous curved wall, and other ones might prefer a flat wall because they're doing dolly and truck shots instead of panning shots. Yeah. So it's very hard to create a, a fence exactly around cinema creation, but XR is a little bit different. Yeah. The reason I asked that, because it, it, there's a difference between uh, BBC doing its Olympic studio as one, which is a more tried and tested traditional environment, and someone in the museum trying to create a location-based experience that actually is functional, timely, and everything else. Um, what about you, Johnny? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think when you're talking about turnkey solutions, that's kind of how I would film, talk about the productization of this. So XR, absolutely right. Um, and I think what you were saying um, about the volume as a product, I think that's something that we are finding, having launched Mars Volume in August, um, to really be working. 
And so I think we're finding a range of different projects that for particular scenes, and I think you were talking about applications before, so we were talking about higher level kind of buckets of application, but if we're talking within film or within TV series, um, we're finding some real quick wins and that in-camera VFX, and it's quite obvious, but a gateway drug is driving scenes. So people really love shooting cars on Mars volume. And so that's been a really good way for us to get into showing production companies how it works. It's an educational moment. It's, you know, and there's a lot of history of shooting cars in the studio with kind of back projection and that kind of thing. So I think this is what's really important when you're adopting new innovation to a market, is don't throw everyone in the deep end, but find out what's that natural next step. Um, and I'm sure within the corporate arena as well, you guys are finding, you know, rather than blowing people's minds with this huge big setup, what's that natural kind of gateway drug or that next step that's going to let the client get their head around the first bit? Yeah. The next year they come to do it, they want to build on top of that. And so that's certainly what we're finding um, as we outreach to clients. Because really our objective was to make virtual production within film and TV as accessible as possible to the widest range. And so scripted series is great, documentary is great, advertising, huge opportunities. So yeah. Yeah, I'd love to, to, to answer that as well. With um, So White Light has actually done this journey with XR, so, and it's been going for about four years. And the focus of this is about standardising a package where your entry level into XR doesn't have to be here. It doesn't have to be at a million dollars. Your entry level into XR could be an LED wall and a track camera and a bit of AR graphics. And, and, and what we've tried to do with that Smart Stage brand is say, well, here's five ways that you as a corporate or a university or a museum can access XR as a campus, as a technology. We've stripped away all the technical complexity and given you an iPad. And we've given you a Crestron unit, an AV operating interface. So you can explore and enjoy XR as, as zoom on steroids. Think of it like that. You rock up with your PowerPoint, you plug it into the wall, you're suddenly in a virtual world, your client's on the stage, and it's been as low friction as possible for you to adopt that technology. Of course now, eight months down the line, our corporate clients are going, well, we want to do more. What can we do next? What can we do next? And, and that challenges us all yeah. to put our R&D and all the things we're figuring out back into that productization. So the clients are then re-energized with the new technology coming through that they can access. And that's the thing, accessible technology for the end client. Yeah. For us it's been the same. I think there's also a large element of, uh, all of these are very you know, large established corporations. And they, are, they can be quite hesitant as well and, and, and slow moving in adoption of new technologies. And the world has actually been very fast moving. So I think for us it's also, productization is a really big thing, but especially what is the product that you're selling? What is the end result that you're looking for? And within what budget category does that fall into? And that will strongly drive, you know, what, what exactly is the solution? What, what type of LED product are we going to be using? What is the processing? Do we need uh, uh, do we need a Crestron unit or an iPad for people to easily interact with because they're maybe not so technical? Uh, you know, what what is the environment that the the, the product is going to have to be functioning within? So designing those solutions is uh, I think is really exciting because this market is super young, right? It's it's maturing more every day, and and all of us are trying to push that development along to make sure that the, these solutions for these different markets are, are the most responsive they can be. And uh, they also have to be scalable so that you can roll them out in different places and, uh, and make sure that, like uh, Joanna was saying, you know, talking about volumes and, 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 and running those, there will be upsides and downsides to everything. You know, like I think if you run a volume of a set design, there's a lot you can achieve within that. And then, yeah, for film or, you know, maybe more flexible budgets, you can have different screen setups. But for corporate clients, that's not likely to be the case. That's where a set volume is probably the way to go. Um, or a combination of AR and physical elements. Well, for corporate clients, you could have retail, couldn't you? I mean, a retail environment, they're desperate to get new experiences and influencing people to buy. 
Yes, exactly. No, this is really big important. headquarters with, you know, pulling people into a really big environment. Fantastic. I'm thinking of applications here. Sorry, I'm wittering on there. Probably couldn't handle it. But it's not, not a great... Um, anyway, we're trying to manage it here. Um, yeah, retail undergo undergoing a huge transformation at the minute. And some of the bigger central locations trying to balance that investment in new technology with a, a way of allowing customers to access the things subtly, but also in a way that influences their buying and encourages them to almost experience and lead it on to the next stage. And we have lots of different combinations of technologies that together, intelligently and thoughtfully, um, can perhaps move the customer experience on a level that will create something they can engage with. And it's about engagement with customers. And this sort of technology has the potential to be used in a variety of types of installation at whatever level to provide that engagement, provide the content is put together intelligently and in a way where it understands the customer's behavior. And that's what it's going into a different level of understanding how customers operate and how they respond to technology, what persuades them to buy new things. And that retailers had such a tough time, they're having to rethink completely the relationship you have with their customers. So this sort of thing potentially is, is limitless, isn't it? David. <laughs> um, yes, it's limitless, I guess. <laughs> it, it, ret retail, retail's an interesting one. Like that's not the world we're in at all, I guess. Like we build, tier one massive volumes and I guess that access, if we go back to the access to technology piece, that's actually incredibly difficult for us because we're building these humongous stages to try and build that flexibility and you know we are building these stages to try and be flexible and we can't change them for every production because they are so expensive you know I'm talking tens of millions of dollars for some of the stages we build you know as if we take V stage by Warner Bros, you know, that's 90 by 9 meters of LED, 2,600 panels <laughs> just on the wall before you get to the ceiling, which is another thousand or so panels, you know. So, how do you give people access to this technology, which is so new and so fresh, and which realistically, at that, at that, at that leading edge, in three years, you know, they're probably going to have to change it, <laughs> you know, and yeah, how. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a long term investment. Um, <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's the productization and standardization around that as well. And that's a big part of what we're looking at in the entire NEP group is okay, what can we standardize and make accessible? Whether even if just like the server technology or the server rack, you know, so a team can go from one stage to another and be like, okay, even though I'm driving 2,000 panels instead of 200, I can still understand what's going on here. And also, allows them to go from a smaller, maybe R&D size space, which is accessible to a corporate client or an advertising client to use, which is much cheaper per day. They know their workflow is going to work before they turn up and are spending tens of thousands of pounds just for the space rentals before you think about the hundreds of people on the film crew. And that's a big part of what we at Lux Machina are focused on as well is moving at the stage of production. We can't be there holding up a DOP, a director, you know, that'd be disastrous basically, be costing so much money. Um, I don't think I asked your, answered your question about retail, but... <laughs> you, you don't need to, it's just a suggestion of thought. Poor old day, it always gets the end of my uh, questions. It's not that it take a long time because you talk a lot. It's nothing to do with that, it's just that I always ask a question that requires a big answer to it. Um, I just wonder actually, people watching here at the moment, whether they're involved in any kind of virtual production or thinking of adopting it, or just interested in how it works, and whether they have any questions, whether they want, because here, now would be a really good time, yeah. Jess, do you want to give him my microphone? Uh, so obviously you've spoken about the corporate space of film and media sort of spaces. Um, I think the last two years, especially in the entertainment industry, has taken a big hit. Um, so I'm just curious like what do you think about the utilisation of this technology in places like the Lost Horizons Festival which took uh, the entertainment into a virtual world and uh, kind of what that means moving forward really. I'll start and pass the bow. Um, yeah Lost Horizons have been doing some really cool stuff in the metaverse and the metaverse is obviously 
a big buzzword at the moment, faster Mr. Zuckerberg. I don't think anyone quite knows how we're going to interface with the metaverse yet. But virtual production is a perfect gateway to that. And actually, we worked with Lost Horizons to help get the DJs in there and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the metaverse is huge. I don't know how to work, how we're going to work with it, but we will. And also, actually, going back to the live experience thing, you know, there's really interesting technologies about having what what you can see behind me versus what the camera can see it can be completely different. And I think that's yeah. huge for the live environments and things like that, which will support that industry. I'll, I'll try and answer it a little bit. I think the the key thing with, with live events is they are shared experiences in person. And uh, a lot of the metaverse is really about VR for a lot of people, I think. I think the, the exciting developments are going to be in AR glasses in the coming years so that people can be in the same room, they can physically see each other, they can keep interacting, but there is this additional layer on top of, you know, uh, meta, if I guess that's the word that we're all <laughs> going to stick with, is, is, you know, that will elevate that experience in that case. Uh, but it's, all of this stuff is very subjective, very much in development, right? So uh, I, I, there will be uh, a lot of experiences designed for the metaverse in VR. Yeah. They're really just games, right? We're just walking around in video game levels and maybe there's interaction, but I think there's a big question about accessibility because a lot of people don't like wearing headsets. It doesn't work for everybody. People, you know, they get disorientated. So. I think it depends on the crowds and what you're designing for and, and, and what the event is. Uh, and there will be really interesting things uh, being developed in that area because it's really, it's, it's very inviting to create things that have not been done before and they specifically don't need to be standardized. They can be really exciting and very uh, high experimentation and it's, it's some really exciting things are happening in that world. And I think it's in, in many ways, uh, I think live events are going to be very exciting in the coming you know, 12 to 24 months or so, uh, enabled by those technologies, for sure. Yeah, I think um, it, the metaverse, I'm with Vince, you know, it's really difficult for us at the moment to imagine where we fit in with that as we're an in-person experience driven industry. But if you think about the venues that are being built now, so esports venues, immersive entertainment, actually your metaverse is going to exist in those spaces. So if you if you arrive into an esports arena and you're you're assaulted by digital signage, but that digital signage is interactive and it knows who you are and it picks up elements of your metaverse character or your persona and you shop that way. So you go and shop physically for your metaverse. You might go buy trainers, sneakers, AR versions. I don't know. I think that. That convergence for the immersive entertainment world that we're going into, those venues being built now, that's where these two worlds merge, I think, from live into this, this tech, I think. We're missing a critical vision hardware piece at the moment and so at the moment it's sort of we, we kind of know what this future might end up be but it's the steps to kind of get there uh, is a bit unknown so I mean I guess I guess for us at Build we're working as you guys are on augmented reality for live broadcast now that's kind of in the future going to seem really basic but that's like one of the steps that's going moving us towards this future and so I'm extremely curious, what is this vision hardware trigger that suddenly means that mass adoption will happen and then you'll just see this escalation. So there's kind of at the moment we're missing that puzzle piece to get us into this next kind of pool of experimentation and innovative development. But um, it's coming, it's going to be great. Um, I believe that uh, immersive themed experiences are going to be a huge push in the future to get people more into what is being experienced um, from third party perspectives. So I think the technology that is being developed is going to help get us there, but the big missing part right now, of course, is the personal devices that would bring that themed immersive experience to this technology. Great question. Oh, the question. Thanks so much. Is that okay for you? Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Yeah, no, good question. Good question. Yeah, thanks. I think we did uh, a story on that, sort of enough. I, um, I didn't write it, sadly. I didn't know. We, are, we are on it. We're following the stuff. Any, anything else you'd like to? Anybody else here? If they all got off for lunch, by the way, No? Well, um, I think that's it. Thanks very much, everyone. That's really interesting. Stuff one to cover, actually, and putting it in the right perspective and communicating 
the huge importance of this actually to the AV industry and generally speaking and seeing so many markets developing. I mean, it's quite an exciting time, I think, isn't it, really? It's nice to see that Navy. People forget that thing is a bit boring. And, but actually, it's, it's a hugely innovative time. We're trying to get new talenting and new, new, new thought into the industry. And I think things like this, creating new experiences, are probably a, a great way of doing it. But um, I hope that was entertaining for you. And thank you very much, everyone.